guys, my name is Jackie Sanders. Like your professor said, I am a visual artist and painter. I have a community facing studio in downtown Raleigh, and that is where I make all of my work. So I've been in the studio, it's called Art Space. It's a large uh, warehouse downtown that has artist studios and art galleries and workshops. So I've been there since the middle of 2020, moved in right during the pandemic. So it was kind of served as my colorful sanctuary during that crazy time. Um, but before that even, probably for about the past two or three years, I've been displaying my work throughout Raleigh and the surrounding area in solo and group exhibitions. Um, and I also show, share, and sell my work on my personal website, especially this day and age with the technology taking over. It's kind of a necessity for a career-minded artist to get your work out there, both in person and exhibitions, but also online. Um, so I really like to share a behind the scenes view of my process digitally. Um, and through that, me and a business partner of mine, Adriana, who's also a visual artist, we co-host a podcast called the Art Studio Insights Podcast, where we really do that, try to demystify the creative process, share our thoughts and ideas with other emerging artists, as well as we started a membership for artists called the Level of Artist Community. So really bringing people together, no matter what level of the art path you're on, building that community aspect of it. But um, through all of these, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with so many different organizations, both in Raleigh, in North Carolina, and abroad. Um, a few of these names you might recognize, um, having some publication features in Raleigh Magazine. Like I said, Art Space is where I have my studio now. Um, and really being fortunate to collaborate with so many amazing organizations. But right now, these are the main things that I'm working on as an artist. Um, so when I look at my body of work, as I'm sure you've talked about in this class, a lot of the time artists may work in series and have multiple projects going at one time. So. Right now, my main focuses, which I tried to bring a few examples of each, um, uh, are original acrylic paintings. So these are anywhere from four inch, four inch to three foot by three foot. Um, a series called my shadow paintings, which are the boxed framed pieces over here, which I will talk about more later. Um, and art products as well. So rather than having original pieces of art, they're still original designs, but might be more everyday type objects, doing stickers and inspiration cards and color catchers, as you can see here, which again, I will talk about later. Um, but for the terms of today, I did wanna talk a little bit about how I've gotten here in the past 10 years and really what those creative influences are. I think it's really awesome being able to hear from other artists of where they are, what work they're working on, but even more so helpful seeing where they've come from, where, what are those influences along the way that got them to where they are. So this is where it all started. I am not from Raleigh originally. I am from um, the suburbs right outside of Baltimore, Maryland. This is my childhood home where my parents still live. And more specifically, this is my very first art studio. So we turned our backyard shed into a studio when I was in high school, I was like, you're not really using these lawnmower and old bikes, right? So we just moved those back into the backyard, built some desks in there, um, and kind of had it as my first colorful sanctuary um, over 10 years ago now. And the second biggest influence in my work was really coming from my parents. Um, both of them have that creative eye. They own their own architecture firm in Baltimore it's called Sanders Designs. So architecture is definitely a huge influence of my work. Growing up, we used to go on vacations where my dad would be wandering the streets just looking at the architecture. We would go and visit Frank Lloyd Wright homes and go camping there as our vacations. So always having that constant influence of geometric lines, urban landscapes, and being attracted to seeing those fine details of how buildings are constructed inevitably has influenced the work that I make today. Um, but at the time, I really wasn't making the best work in the world. It was definitely the classic junior, senior in high school, really just wanting to explore every possible medium, concept, style that I could. So this is just a handful of the pieces that I made 
um, 10 years ago. You, all of them are different mediums, so doing everything from torn up found objects, some sculptural shadow work, um, more realistic um, with the paper bag or the plastic bag over there, more abstracted realistic, um, a little bit of portraiture, and then these two, I think being tied very closely to my current style, but really exploring geometric shapes, composition, and like we were talking about earlier in today's class, those basic elements of design and seeing what, as my creative voice, how can I share that and express that in a way that felt right to me, but limited, understandably, with certain materials. I didn't necessarily have that intense vocabulary, um, but I was really unpacking a lot of concepts with my work that I'm still figuring out today, really being drawn towards light and shadow, pieces that change over time, bold colors with these color pencil drawings that I don't even want to know how many hours I spent just like <laughs> coloring in these two foot blocks where this day and age an illustrator, you could probably do the very same design. Um, but putting in those hours, putting in that sweat for um, really just exploring what my work could become. Um, so then moving forward into college, I went to Virginia Tech. I majored in studio art um, and got a another bachelor's in art history, as well as a minor in business leadership, and later a master's in exhibition design. So even just from the list of those degrees, you can tell I really just wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. Um, when in school, really wanting to just explore different mediums, have as many experiences as possible, be involved with everything. Um, and Virginia Tech was the perfect place for me to do that especially once I got um, a professor that I felt like I really, really connected with. As with most art majors, you have different classes that are, okay, you have to take a pottery class and a painting class and a drawing class and continue exploring different mediums. But one of my professors, Eric Stanley, he was our foundations professor, so my very first year, um, and he was doing his own experimentation with laser engraving and paper cutting. So the detailed piece that you can see on the left, it's actually several layers of laser cut paper stacked on top of each other. So some of his pieces are maybe 10 sheets of paper, some are 3,000. And each of them are individually designed with a computer program um, that then would be laser cut. You can see here on the left, this is a CO2 laser they'll be laser cut out on the machine. You have to poke out any holes of little pieces that may have gotten stuck in the paper that didn't want to come out. And then they're all layered together to make these beautiful geometric compositions. Um, and so working under him was really that turning point for my work and really having that fusion that I felt like I was needing of on hand uh, creativity and the art making process but also that technology element. That was a component that really intrigued me. Um, so I mentored under him and spent several hours. He would do the designs and I was more of the production side of some of his pieces. Sitting there in a dark room, cutting out with the laser and all of his design aspects, stacking them together. Because some of these single sheets may take 45 minutes to cut out of the machine repeat times a thousand, you can do the math. So the very, even with technology being included, it was a very intense production process, but a super, super beneficial one because having that hands-on experience with the technology really stirred up a lot of curiosity with my creative process. So this was my senior studio space. Um, I like to take over the rooms that I have my studio space in, like no, no, no surface is off limits. I like to hang everything up, which is still true today. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, okay, how can I merge this technology and the physical fine art of paintings that I was doing in classes that I was responding to, how could I fuse them together? Um, so you can see over here, I was doing a lot of the layering of acrylic paint, as you can see in some of my pieces that I brought today as well. Um, and then on the left, I was experimenting a lot with mirrors. So 
how can I use the laser engraver to incorporate mirrors or create dimension with mirrors? Because a lot of the concepts I was exploring were around identity, the self that you project to the world versus your true self, um, and what those layers can mean symbolically through the geometric shape. So bringing all these elements together, I started creating light paintings right here. This was more of a study where it's basically two pieces of glass that look like it's an infinity tunnel of space, but realistically, it's only about this big. And so I was thinking, okay, rather than just keeping this as a light painting or just having acrylic on the surface, what if I fuse the two together? And so I basically turned my paintings into sculptures. Um, which I think was definitely influenced by the architecture background that I grew up with. Um, I definitely don't consider myself a sculptor, but a lot of the pieces that I make have that depth exploration aspect or you have an experience with the piece itself. So these were pieces that on the left here were in progress photos of the front of the pieces on the right here are the back, so that the front and the back of the piece, you have a completely different experience. And these became part of my senior exhibition. So this was a series of four pieces called um, the Taking Control series. So really reclaiming my identity was a lot of the concepts I was exploring. This is the view as soon as you're entering into a space. Um, it basically became four sculptures throughout it. Um, you can see the acrylic painting on the front. There's mirror, mirror light sculptures in the middle. And then when you got, when you were walking through the space, your experience with the pieces would shift. Because rather than seeing just the acrylic painting on the front, you started seeing the geometric shapes on the back. So this is one piece. On the left is the front view. On the right is the back view. And you see that there are these larger chemical compounds that are then affecting the mirror design that you see on the front of the panel. So it gives explanation to that underlying layer of identity. And once you see the back of it, you can't experience the front of the piece the same way. So from the back of the gallery as seen on the left, you really have a completely different view. And the idea of tearing down the walls that sometimes we put up for other people, and once you break that down, your experience is never the same. Um, but this senior exhibition was a huge turning point for my work, especially when it came to exhibition design. So there was a class I took called Exhibition Design, really thinking about, again, the 3D space and experience of artwork. So not just thinking about the work and throwing it up on some random wall, but how is this work gonna interact with the space in which you're seeing it? How can you make it an experience? And so everything from trying to figure out the wiring to get lights to hang perfectly behind it, um, and okay, how do you have these sculptures stand up in a gallery where you can't drill into the ceiling and you can't drill into the floor, doing a very fine balance. <laughs> of thinking about all these different display aspects of the work um, and bringing that into the art making process itself. Um, so all of these different components really helped form my education around thinking about what's possible. Yes, the conceptual influences of um, identity and layering of identity, the visual influences of geometric and architecture the process influences of learning this laser engraving process and the challenge of being able to display this work in a way that I had complete control over, for better or worse, <laughs> having all of these components that you have to balance when thinking about the holistic experience of the art world. Um, so that was my senior exhibition about six years ago, but you cannot stay at college forever, even though I definitely tried. I stayed, I did my master's just so I could stay. So I'm like, yeah, sure, that sounds like great. I'll just stay here. Um, but eventually I did work my way down to Raleigh, North Carolina. So I went from Baltimore to Virginia Tech to Raleigh, just working my way down. Um, and after juggling a few part-time jobs, 
I ended up working full time at a corporate awards and engraving studio. So this is definitely not where I saw my professional progression going, but it, in hindsight, was weirdly perfect for what I needed. I definitely did not see my training with the CO2 laser under my professor as something I would pursue professionally. Um, and I thought I was very experienced with lasers until I accepted this job and you're working with these machines 10 hours a day, every day. And you're like, oh, I actually really didn't know that much. <laughs> but it was enough foundation to get me in the door um, and make beautiful visions come to life, as we used to say. So making everything from um, acrylic awards to uh, laser engraved cutting boards, basically if you think of anything that's personalized is what we did. Um, because this is a small business located right in Cary, North Carolina, um, and we had all of our machines in-house, which was super, super awesome from a creative and skill set development standpoint because I was working hands-on with these machines every single day. So the top left and middle machines are CO2 lasers, very similar to the ones I was using in college. Um, Iris was our UV printing machine, which yes, we named all of our machines. They had personalities. So when they were acting up and be like, Thor's getting a little jealous today because Zine is getting a lot of attention if we have a big job. Um, so Iris was our UV printing machine. We had Samothy, which is a sandblaster. And all of these different technologies that really, again, I think spurred my creative mind of what is possible, um, which I have found in hindsight is very helpful and needed for my concepts and creative process. Um, really having that intrigue and feeling like a total beginner again with a new medium or a new style or a new technology and just playing and experimenting was super important. Um, so this is an example of a few things that we made with my day job at that time. So yeah, engraving the backs of guitars or making super custom um, displays and plaques, doing everything from wedding gifts to fine glass crystal corporate awards. So really doing the whole range of what was possible um, on any given day. And so through that, I started to dive back into my creative process. Right after college, I kind of took a well-needed break from a burnout standpoint. Um, I was obviously living in a new city, wanting to um, just dive into my day job. I wasn't really building my own artwork, but by being consistently exposed to these machines, I started to have that curiosity again. So it was really about 2018 that I started experimenting with, okay, now that I have access to this technology, um, how can I keep incorporating that into my work? I tried to kind of go back to the light series sculptures that I was making in college. That didn't necessarily feel right. So I was like, okay, we're at square one again, is what the mindset I had was. So how can I layer this technology? How can I maybe add to the surface or subtract to the surface? Because at the time, that technology, we had some were additive, putting ink on the surface, some were subtractive, like laser engraving the paint. So this you can see were just some experiments that I had, putting acrylic paint down on a panel and then after vectorizing my designs in a vector program called Corel Draw um, that we use for our CO2 lasers, taking away those different elements and what elements remained, what were completely taken. And this was my little mock home setup that I had from the second bedroom of my apartment corner that turned into my art studio. Um, and I think the biggest turning point for me was f with our UV printer, when we started doing these acrylic standoff awards. So these were super custom awards that we did in-house, we did the design, and having the technology to cut down plexiglass acrylic, take it to another machine, UV print the color ink on the back, um, and layer these components, as you can see on the left, creating that depth of space was super intriguing to me. Um, the awards themselves look cool, people love them, but my brain instantly went to laser engraving with my professor and his layering of paper. So I'm like, well, what happens if I could layer now acrylic and make these bigger sculptures? Um, and so that's what I started to explore and study. 
these were a handful of my first studies. I really had no intention of what they would become. I didn't have any expectations of displaying them or even sharing them with anybody. Um, and so they really start out as pure exploration studies. What happens if I isolate colors? What happens if I um, stick with one palette? What happens if I remove some of the background and let the shadow just cast onto the wall? And this is really where I feel like my new voice as an artist started to come to life. Um, right around that time when I was gaining momentum, I moved out of my home, apart, uh, home art studio and into my studio at ArtSpace. Um, I first moved into a small studio, it was Studio 214 there. And this past July, I moved into a larger space you can see on the left, so Studio 220. And this is really where I've been able to take my current pieces to that next level. Um, as you can see with the pieces I brought here, there's a couple that I'm working on at the same time because I just physically have that space to explore six panels at once rather than literally using an old like tailgating table as my paint surface, which I was doing in my home studio. And so having a set area to really explore these new concepts and ideas has been really pivotal for um, my exploration and process. So right now, like I said at the beginning, I'm really doing three main series. This first one, the Shadows of Influence series, um, here's a piece, as you can see here, of, um, it's called Opening. And so really wanting to create experiences with my work, even if they aren't site installations like my senior show was, like work made for a specific space, how can I engage the viewer in their experience with the work by incorporating light and shadow elements so that you never really experience the work the same way twice? Um, I've always been intrigued by light and shadow, and especially with this series, I start with acrylic paint on panel for the back layer and then doing just one layer of UV printed acrylic, um, plexiglass acrylic that's hovering over the surface to cast shadows onto the panel behind it. So whether you have a spotlight on the piece, whether it's illuminated by natural daylight, the shadows shift and uh, change. They might be super intense if you have a spotlight or might have more soft edges if it's in a more evenly lit room like today. And so having pieces where you really can't experience it the same way twice and really slowing people down as they view the piece and interact with it moving around as the light changes is really the mission for this series as a whole. Um, so this first piece, as you can see, is a framed version of it, very contained. And then I s am also exploring the idea of what happens if these are not contained. I mean, light and shadow within our world aren't normally kept in a perfect box. So what happens if then the wall that it's displayed on becomes a part of the piece? Um, yes, keeping acrylic paint panel elements of it, but then the shadows taking life as they're cast onto the wall behind it. Um, and then completely stripping it of color. What happens when rather than being maybe distracted by the color or projecting intention with the color, it's simply the shadow is the artwork itself. Um, and so really having this series to push components around um, and explore multiple layers has been super, super fun, and I'm excited to see where they will go. Um, the next series I work on are original art products. Um, so I did not bring these today, but really creating, again, wanting p artwork that people can live with in their everyday lives. It, even if you can't necessarily invest financially in a large original painting, having pieces that bring light and color to people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, so this series here are what I call my color catcher series. So they're very similar to stained glass that you would hang in the window, but realistically, if you're gonna buy a big piece of stained glass, they are very heavy, very fragile, and not the most cost-effective because they're very labor-intensive pieces to make. So I wanted to create a lightweight, super durable, affordable option for people that can still be hung in your window. You can move it around room to room. If you have cats or dogs that might knock it over, you don't have to worry about it breaking. And so these are actually the same acrylic material 
with the UV printed so the light comes in behind them. You can, there's purposeful negative space within the design so that nature and the man-made geometric elements play together. And again, from the experience standpoint, they change throughout the year. Your experience at 6 a.m. at sunrise is very different than at peak sun. And constantly trying to slow people down and make them more aware of the space that they are in. Um, the third series I'm working on are my main series that I'm displaying in corporate offices and galleries um, is the Beauty and the Breaking series. Um, and so these are acrylic paintings anywhere from four inch squares to three foot squares, one of which is the purple one in front here today. Um, and this series, while there is no light shadow component, I still wanted to make them become experiences. So all of them have, uh, t uh, have questions as their titles. And so when you experience the work, you can obviously view it from a design standpoint, experience it, but then having the title add a new layer to the piece. You experience it differently. And as you live with the piece over time, or maybe you see it in a couple of different exhibitions, you as the viewer are bringing your life experiences, your current uh, struggles in life to these questions. And the question, like for example on the right, it's entitled, Now What? That means very different things to everyone, and it will mean something different today than it does tomorrow for the same person. So really still wanting to bring people, yes, these are pieces that I make, but wanting to make it an experience for the people viewing it. Um, and so overall, as I wrap up, I'm excited to hear your guys' questions, but a few things that I wanted to share, um, of things that I really learned during this creative evolution that's still ever evolving, and I know um, you guys are not art majors, but I think there's still lessons that apply universally. So the biggest thing is Letting your creative influences change. So as you learn and change environments, not being held back from a previous self that may lo no longer serve you. This can be creative influences, um, mentors, inspirations, both from an art making process or just in life of constantly reevaluating is this direction that I want to still be going in and giving yourself the freedom to reassess when necessary. Um, and also the freedom to play and experiment and just lean towards what you're drawn to explore. Sometimes it might not make sense at first. You're like, I don't know why I enjoy doing this, but let me just see what happens. As a freshman in college, I just knew that this new technology intrigued me. I 100% did not think that I would be working with the machinery every day during my previous day job yet alone still incorporating that technology into the artwork I was making, but I'm glad I went ahead and indulged that impulse because it definitely paid off. Um, and then becoming a beginner again and giving yourself assignments can really be a good way to engage yourself in whatever process you're doing. So rather than just taking things at surface value, what happens if I go to this extreme? What happens if I go to this extreme? And letting yourself really just like explore and exhaust new possibilities as a way to open your mind of what's possible. Um, number four, definitely my favorite advice to any students is the fact that your degree does not define where your career can go. Um, like I said, I got my master's in exhibition design. So I planned on working in a museum, working in a gallery, and I absolutely loved my experience in that program. But from a professional standpoint, I'm not really using the degree that much. I've definitely pulled skills from it and loved my experiences and made great connections. But you really have complete control over what you want to do with your life and how you want to market yourself as a professional. So the de degree helps when you're first getting out of school. But after that, you really can go anywhere. <laughs> And finally, finding in-person and virtual mentors to keep your education ever evolving. I think this day and age, that's kind of an obvious statement with the internet, with YouTube, with podcasts, with audiobooks, but constantly find sources that can challenge you creatively and professionally or personally to keep that education going.